Well, good morning, church. All right, what a great opportunity we have to come into the house of the Lord today and to uh, worship Him and to lift Him up in praises, and that's what we're going to do this morning. My name is Jeff, and as always, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. We have a very special guest in the house today that I will uh, introduce just a little bit later. But for right now, if you will, let's stand together, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask the Lord to come and just be a part of our service. You know, every week I, I try to reiterate this so that everybody understands what we do and why we do it. You know, we don't just play songs because we like them. We don't just play them because, you know, we heard them this week on the radio or whatever. You know, we're ushering in the spirit of the Lord today into this room. So it's important that we prepare our hearts for the word. This is the way that we do it. We give him honor and we give him glory through music. So if you will, let's bow our heads. We're going to ask the Lord to come be a part of our service today. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, and thank you for giving us this place to come and to worship you, God. So this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit would sweep across the room, fill every single person in this room. Dear Lord, if there's something in our lives that's preventing you from doing that today, I pray that we lay those things at the foot of the cross this morning. We somehow draw closer to you by what happens in this room today. I pray for Brother Craig if he if he's prepared a message to penetrate these hearts of stone that we have, these walls that we've built up around our lives. And I just pray that you speak through him this morning. Dear Lord, I pray for every note that's played and every phrase that's sung and every word that's spoken here today. I pray that your honor, your glory will be seen by what is done here this morning. So come be a part of our service, God. Come and inhabit the praises of your people this morning. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, we've got a lot to be thankful for this morning, and uh, we've been through a lot over the past few years. And the name of the song is called Alive and Breathing, and the, the phrase line in this song is, if, if you're still alive and breathing, then you have reason to praise the Lord, amen. So how many people, by hand clap of praise this morning, is going to help us do that? Amen. All right, let's go.
this morning. Church, you may be seated this morning. Let's give the Lord all the honor and glory and praise. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I want to take just a minute and go through just a couple of announcements. Um, for those of you that grabbed one of these on the way in, there's several on here, but there's, there's a few that I'm going to highlight this morning. And uh, the first one is, it's mark your calendar for Vacation Bible School. Okay, that's going to start on uh, the 13th of this month, 13th through the 17th, uh, 9 a.m., 12 p.m. And anybody that needs more information on that, see Anna uh, Norman. She's in the nursery this morning. Uh, well, actually, she's still, in, she's still in the room right now, but she'll be down there later. So make sure that you see her or Haley Harcrow for those that, uh, that either have not signed up to help yet or intend to and um, maybe just coordinate with her exactly what's going on there. I know that we need uh, some specific help that uh, Miss Trish is going to talk with us about a little bit later. And also today we have a... Uh, 2023 budget team vote okay so anyone that has not received the little piece of paper that has five uh, blanks on it 
Uh, what that is, that is for our budget team vote this morning. And if you do not have one, just raise your hand, and uh, uh, we're going to get one to you. Jason's going to help us out with that, so thank you, Brother Jason, for that. Everyone else has one that needs one, right? It's an important vote. Everybody needs to make sure that you participate in this one because uh, the budget team is kind of, you know, how we spend the money. <laughs> so we'll make sure that we get the right people in place for that, okay? Anybody else need one? All right, good deal. And uh, also, too, uh, there is a, I don't know if you guys know it or not, and maybe you do, and just kind of it gets glossed over sometimes as the announcements are rolling through, but there is a church app. And I use it every week, and uh, Brother Ron, what he does, he attaches his sermon notes to the church app. So if you pull up the church app, and uh, you, you select, you know, the First Baptist Church, Hope's Bluff, of course, and uh, his sermon notes are already there. So you don't have to write them down. You can just look at it and follow along, right? But uh, thank, um, for those of you that do not have that, just make sure that you look up um, the church app and then find the right uh, uh, church for that, and you'll be able to follow along very easily every Sunday morning as uh, Brother Ryan uploads those things. All right, so uh, that's really all that I have as far as important announcements uh, for, the, for right now. We'll come back to a few later at the end uh, to remind us about a few things. But if you will this morning, would you stand again with us as we continue uh, our worship this morning? And uh, I hope you guys don't mind, but uh, we're going to play an old one, but it's a good one this morning, all right? You guys don't mind if we do that, do you? Four. great to know that we can still play those old hymns and, you know, and still enjoy our time with the Lord today. Amen. I've heard a thousand songs. 
stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a girl. good good father this morning thank you for that church if you will you'll be seated and uh, right now this is your time for children's church so for those of you that uh, are involved in that if you will if you'll come forward and exit to either my left or my right uh, this is your time to shine so you guys come on and I want to take just a moment and just introduce our guest speaker today uh, this is brother Craig Carlisle brother Craig and I go back a long way so uh, thank you for being here, Brother Craig. We love you, and um, uh, just please bring what the Lord has given uh, on your heart today. Uh, before Brother Craig gets started, you guys know that we kind of have this thing here, that before the message starts, we give this joke, right? So when Brother Ryan isn't here, it's kind of falling on me to be uh, the stand-up comedian, right? 
All right. And one of my favorite things to do is to look up lumberjack jokes. All right. So the last one I did, I think it went over really, really well. So we're going to try this again. Okay. So uh, what do you get when you watch a lumberjack chop down a tree? Well, you get bored. I can honestly say I've never been set up like that. I <laughs> well, Jeff, I'm glad you follow through with tradition because uh, I was told that that was an expectation. I'm glad he did it, and I didn't have to. <laughs> but it is a joy to be with you here at First Baptist Church, Oak Bluff. Uh, as Jeff said, I'm Craig Carlisle. For those of you who may not know me, I'm the director of missions for Edible Baptist Association. We have 83 churches that are spread out across Etowah, and we actually have three that are in Blount County, that I have the privilege of pastoring the pastors, and uh, I love what I do, and because of the virtue, by virtue of my position, I'm in a different church in Etowah County just about every week, uh, having the opportunity to preach or to visit just to go in and meet the people and visit with the pastor and enjoy some uh, time of fellowship. And it's always an honor when a pastor invites me to speak and, and they trust me to fill their pulpit and uh, preach the word. And that's part of my responsibility as uh, the director of missions. We've are, we're already in prayer for everybody's vacation Bible school. We are thrilled at the association that everybody's having Bible school this year. The last couple of years, have been challenges, and we're grateful that everybody's back in uh, to the VBS groove, and we're looking forward to hearing many great reports of children being saved and families being impacted through uh, Vacation Bible School. But it is a joy and an honor uh, for me to be with you this morning. I want to invite you to take your Bibles or your uh, phones, devices, whatever you may have or use, and turn with me to the 17th chapter of the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 14 together this morning. I'm not going to read them in their entirety. We're going to work through them as we work through the message this morning. It is no secret that we are in a mess in our world and in our culture and in our nation today. The challenges that we are facing are are very, very real. Uh, the challenge of school shootings and mass shootings that we have heard of recently, even as, this, as of this morning. This morning I had one of our pastors, one of our Etowah Baptist pastors, text me to tell me that his church, right here in Etowah County, has had a credible threat that a man was going to come in with a gun into their church this morning. They had to move their services online. The man has been arrested uh, for the threat and for other things that were going on in his life and in his family. But I share that story with you that what we hear on a national level could very well happen on a local level. We have to be conscious of things today. Southern Baptists have just this, these last couple of weeks have had to deal with a report that said that we were guilty of covering up sexual abuse in our churches that had been reported, that we have not handled those properly, and, and you may have an opinion about that, but nonetheless, we are having to deal with that as a denomination during these days. It seems that everywhere we turn, we are facing a new and different challenge. And it doesn't seem to be getting easier. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a physician first, and then God called him to preach. He's a pastor in London, England, and he said this. He said, this is the glory of the Word of God. It is always up to date, and it is always relevant. I want you to hear that statement again. This is the glory of the Word of God, that it is always up to date, and it is always relevant. The book of Jeremiah is a portrait of the death of a nation. 
as you read the book of Jeremiah, it happens right before our very eyes. The kingdom of Judah is slowly falling apart under the infection of evil, which has spread across the face of their land. From the king down to the common people. By the time you get to chapter 17 of Jeremiah, it has been heading toward the inevitable climax of the judgment of God. The invasion of the nation and the overthrow of the kingdom. This did not come about suddenly. It didn't happen overnight. Jeremiah's ministry lasted over 40 years, and God's patience waited throughout that time for any, even even a last-ditch repentance. The nation could have turned back to God, but the nation persisted in its evil. In spite of the warnings and the preaching of Jeremiah, they completely and utterly refused to listen to what Jeremiah was telling them to do. In many ways, we are facing the parallel of this in our day. We, too, are facing constantly worsening times. The primary message of then and of this book is how to face an increasingly cruel and tough world. That's what Jeremiah teaches us. How do we face a world like this? How do we face a world that is getting worse and worse and worse? How do we face a culture that is continually changing things on us? How do we do that and remain Remain faithful to God. What is it that you and I must do? And so it brings us to the question of this hour that I want to present to you this morning, and that is, to whom shall we go? To whom shall we turn? Who are we going to turn to in this hour? God's response to their continual wickedness is actually found back up in Jeremiah 16 and verse 21, when God says through Jeremiah, Therefore, I am about to inform them. And this time I will make them know my power and my might. That they will know, that they will know that my name is the Lord. What a response from God. This time, he says, I, he says I'm about to inform them. This time they will know my power and my might. This time they will know that my name is the Lord. It's only by this utter collapse that of all that men trust, by the utter collapse of all that men trust in, that they will ever turn to God. Have you noticed how stubborn we are? How difficult we are to to get our attention. Something drastic, something major, something catastrophic, something devastating often has to happen before we wake up and say something's got to be done. Something's got to change. Something's got to happen. We're last minute people. We, We have to be shown that times are desperate. We don't realize it. We don't seem to realize it on our own. It takes an example to get our attention, and, and the people of the book of Jeremiah are really, are really no different. It seems that the only way God can get our attention is to bring us to the end of ourselves. We resist and resist and get ourselves into all kinds of trouble and fall apart, and, and then our eyes are open and we see God. We see his power. We see his might. We see, we see his love. Judgment is coming, and And they are going to experience his power for two reasons. Jeremiah, remember, lasted, prophesied for 40 years, folks. 40 years. And the people never listened to what he had to say. And so God comes and he says, now's the time. Now's the time for them to receive this information. God tells us that they are going to experience his power for two reasons. Number one. Because their evil is deeply entrenched. Because their evil is deeply entrenched. Look at verse 1 of chapter 17. The sin of Judah is written down with an iron stylus. With a diamond point, it is engraved upon the tablet of their heart and on the horns of their altar. It's an 
indicting word against this nation. God is telling them that it is so ingrained in you that it's engraved upon your hearts that, that there seems to be nothing that can, that can erase it. Nothing short of the judgment of God is going to break it, break it loose. We too live in a day that is entrenched in evil and sin. We see it in our culture, and it permeates every strata of our society. It's written on the heart with an iron stylus. We can't seem to shake evil. We can't seem to turn our lives back over to God. We can't seem to change direction. We, have, we struggle with repentance. We struggle with owning our sin. We struggle with admitting that, that we're all sinners, and, and we fall short of the glory. Even those of us who are saved, even those of us who quote Galatians 2.20 and, said, and say that, it is, that I am now crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You and I who are saved and claim that verse and quote that verse, we still struggle with the old self. The old self continues to try to come out of the cross. I'm afraid that in many ways we lose the battle. Is the world winning or is Jesus winning in your life and in, and in my life? Here these people had heard the words of Jeremiah for all these, lo, these many years, and, and yet they would not turn, they would not relent from their evil, relent from their, from their sin. So God comes to them with this word and says, this is what's going to happen because their evil is so deeply entrenched. But he also gives us another reason. He tells us that his judgment is coming because their evil is infectious. Look at verse 2. As they remember their children, so they remember their altars and their asherim. By green trees on the hills, O mountain of mine in the, in the countryside, I will give over your wealth and all your treasures for greeting, your high places for sin throughout your The reason God says that the judgment here in the book of Jeremiah is coming is not only because their evil is entrenched, but because it's infecting their children. The next generation was being infected by, by this. And the way God saw it is that it was, only going to get, it was only going to get worse. Therefore, the hand of God must move in judgment. I can't lose another generation. We're all familiar with the generational slide that we see in our culture today. That is, with each passing generation, fewer and fewer people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Fewer and fewer children are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Fewer and fewer families are remaining faithful to God. And therefore, churches are diminishing. Churches are losing people. Churches are declining. It's happening everywhere. It's happening here in Etowah County. The infection of evil is spreading to, to other generations. And so he closes this section by saying, look at uh, again, let me read verse 3 and then verse 4. I will give up your wealth and all your treasures as plunder because of the sin of your high places and all your borders. You will on your own relinquish your inheritance that I gave you. I will make you serve your enemies in a land you do not know. For you have set my anger on fire, and it will burn forever. God here begins to teach Jeremiah some, some life lessons, and God begins to open his eyes to some new truths about humanity. If we want to understand this day in which we live and what is happening in this tumultuous and turbulent hour, we have to understand what God now teaches Jeremiah. God here is what he's teaching Jeremiah here in this text is what he desires to teach you and I. And the first lesson is to show Jeremiah two ways by which man can live. And I want you to hear me, folks. There's only two ways. Never both, but one or the other. Lesson number one. Our way number one is man 
can trust in man. Man can trust in man. Look at what he says in verse 5. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Here, Jeremiah is introduced to a man who trusts in man, who says that man is the ultimate solution to his own problem who says that it lies with man to work out all the difficulties of his life and to to save himself. Let me ask you this morning, folks, have you ever tried this? Have you ever tried to save yourself? And let me answer that for you. Of course you have. We all have. And there are many who are trying, trying it still. Perhaps even some here this morning are under the mistaken idea that you can save yourself, that somehow, someway, you can muster up enough goodness in your heart to turn things around on your own. But let me tell you that that effort will be futile. You will always fail. You will never be good enough. The Scripture tells us, Paul writes for us in the book of Romans, and he tells us that there is nothing good in us. We are completely depraved. We are completely... We are completely sinful. And God here in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17 and verse 5, says that the man who does that, the man who is continually trying that, is cursed. God is saying that everything that a person who tries to save themselves ultimately does will be brought to nothing. That's what a curse does. When the Bible talks about cursing or a curse, It removes the profit and the worth and the value of anything. So if God says that the man is cursed who tries to save himself, God is saying to you that there is no value in what you're doing. There is no benefit in what you're doing. There is no profit in what you're doing. In other words, you will never achieve what you think you can achieve. And God gives us a symbol of a man who pursues this, or a person who pursues this. Look at verse 6. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes, but will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitants. Plants in the desert are, are dry, and they're seared, and they're stunted in their growth. They are deprived of life-giving water and nutrients in the soil. They are limited. They are shrunken. They are shriveled. This is the life which the person who trusts in man, trusts in himself, or trusts in anybody else, this is the life that you will have. It will be stunted. It will be shriveled. It will be shrunken. It will never live up to its potential because you have deprived yourself of the life-giving water of Jesus Christ, because you are depriving yourself of the the spiritual nutrients that come from a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the spiritual nutrients that come from studying God's Word. As long as you are trying it for yourself, you are depriving yourself of the very thing that will give you life. You're like a plant. God says, this is unacceptable. I cannot abide this. I cannot cannot tolerate this. This person is cursed. No value, no benefit, no profit. The person who does this is not even able to see. But thankfully, Jeremiah doesn't stop there. He tells us that there's another way that man can choose to live. Man can choose to live by trusting in himself and trying to figure things out on his own. But he says the second way is that man can trust in the Lord. Look at verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. If you have a writing utensil, I I would underline, highlight, mark verse 5 and verse 7 if you want to see the contrast of that. Contrast of someone who seeks after the solution in themselves and in the world, and then see the man who trusts in the Lord. 
or seven describes the person that God will sustain, that God will help, that will keep trust alive in, in the Lord himself. Look at verse 8. Look at what he says. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its root by a stream. Listen, if you are a plant in the desert, you can't do that. There is no living water. There is no nutrient in the soil. You are prevented and prohibited from growing if you are in the desert, if you are trying to do it on your own. You can't do it. But God says that there is a way. And will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will be anxious, will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Let me ask you something, folks. What kind of person are you this morning? Are you sitting here in this house of God, in this church, and you are trying as best you can to figure things out on your own? Are you looking to the world for solutions? Are you listening to, to other people beside the Lord himself and you're trying to figure it out and you think you're going you're gonna to make it? Listen to the word of the Lord. You are a plant in a dry and barren place. You are lacking the living water and the nutrients to grow in your life. You will not survive. And the end result, the scripture tells us, of a person who continues to pursue his own solutions and in his own effort and keeps looking to man is an eternal separation from God himself in a place called hell. Then Jeremiah paints for us the picture of the person who trusts in the Lord. You will have access to the living water. You will have access to the nutrients. You will not fear when drought or heat comes. You will continue to bear leaves and you will continue to bear fruit. You will not be anxious if the culture changes. You will not be anxious if the temperature gets hot. You will not be flustered in times of challenge. Why? Because your faith and your trust is in the Lord God Almighty. He's the one that's going to see you through. Jeremiah says that we, we have a choice. When everyone else is giving up, when they look at this world, when everyone is giving up and throwing up their hands, you and I who belong to the Lord and who trust in the Lord remain inwardly strong. You and I who trust in the Lord remain strengthened by the inner reservoir we have through our Savior Jesus Christ. This is the life of trusting God. And if you are a person today who can confidently say, I am a person who is living by the stream, I have put my trust in God and I praise the Lord. If you are not living by the stream, and the anxiety of the things that are happening in this world is getting the best of you, and I invite you to come to Jesus Christ. Let me invite you to come to the stream of living water, the one who will sustain you when things get tough. Now God reveals to us the reason, to Jeremiah, the reason why we struggle. Why do we struggle like we do? Why do we struggle with this choice between man and God, between trusting in man and trusting in God. Why, why do we do that? Look at what he says in verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Why do we struggle? In these two lines, we have the explanation of all the misery and heartache and injustice and evil of life. It all stems from the heart. The heart. The natural life into which we are born has two things wrong with it. Je God tells Jeremiah the first thing that is wrong with it is that it is corrupt. That means it never can function as it 
was originally designed to do. Your heart was designed to function in purity. Your, your heart was designed to function by holiness, by trust in God. That's what God desired it to be. But what happened? Sin entered this world and it has corrupted every one of our hearts to never fulfill all that you expected. It will never fulfill your ideals or bring you to a place where you can be what you would like to be. It is, it is corrupt. The word means that it is fatally flawed and cannot be changed by you. There's nothing that you can do about it, ultimately. It is useless and it is wasted. Therefore, the only thing it is good for is to be put to death. And that is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. He said, you cannot trust your heart, but you can trust me. You cannot die enough to yourself, but I will die for you, and I will pay the price for your sin. Jesus Christ, when he went to the cross, took that fatal nature, that human nature, and he put it to death because that was all it was good for. Jesus Christ had to die on the cross for you and me in order that we might have the opportunity to be saved, in order that we might have the opportunity to have our heart changed. Many people have trouble with this. This is the great divide of humanity. You either believe this, and live the rest of your life in these terms, understanding the fact that if you deny it, it is, it is not true that man, it is not true that man is basically good. You and I have to pick a side. We have to determine if we think that we're good enough and we can be good enough to earn heaven and salvation, or if we have to have the help of Jesus Christ. And as if that were not bad enough, the scripture says that we have this corrupt heart. He says there's also another quality about it. It is deceitful above all things. Have you ever noticed our heart never looks bad like it is? Our heart has the amazing power to disguise itself and look good. This is what is so deceitful about it. This explains why all through the centuries, men continually keep trying to make it better. We believe that, that we are just a few steps away from success. If we just do a little bit of tweaking, if I make a change here and I make a change there, then I can change my heart or mind. Have you ever, have you ever felt that way about yourself? Have you ever looked at yourself and said, you know what, I'm really only just a few steps short of perfection. I know there's a few little things that that I can do. Nothing major. You ever notice that when we're trying to correct ourselves, when we're trying to correct and change our behavior, it's always little things. It's never, it's never big things or anything major. Just a few minor tweaks, which if I could correct, I would be a splendid person that God has made me to be. You ever felt that way? If you have, then you are suffering from the deceitfulness of the heart. It can look good. It has the ability to do so. But it is unable to help itself. It is deceitful above all things. Have you ever noticed that we are never, we're never, never able to fully realize how desperate we are? We always make ourselves better than we really are. We always want to take the shortcut rather than the long road to make those changes. Now, that's the heart. Do you hear what Jeremiah is saying? You can trust in man and God, or you can trust in Jesus and the Lord. But you can't rely upon your heart because it will never be and I want you to know when it comes to the heart that the Bible is the only book in the world which tells you this. 
You will never find this information in any other source. All the studies of humanity will, will, will never lead you to the revelation which men must know if they are going to face life the way it really is. There's no other book, there's no other resource. You can go to Books a Million, Barnes and Nobles, a thousand times in your life looking for that book that is going to correct you and make you a better person, but it won't. It won't be one of those books. There's only one book that tells you the truth about your heart, and that's the Bible. And there's only one person who can correct your heart and fix your heart, and that is Jesus Christ. So then look at what Jeremiah says. At the end of verse 9, he says, Who can understand this? The heart is corrupt, it is the, and it is more deceitful than all else. It is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Lord, if this be true, how do you expect me to run my own life? How do you expect me to solve my problems? I can't even recognize that I have problems. How do you expect me to know what to do? And God answers. Look at verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his doing. Say so you want to know your heart. Look what comes out. Is God at work in you? The well will produce water according to its nature. The tree will produce fruit according to its nature. The Lord Jesus taught us that. And the answer to this is beautiful. Look at verse 11. As a partridge that hatches eggs which it has not laid, so is he who makes a fortune but unjustly. In the midst of his days, it will forsake him, and in the end, he will be uprooted. Now, what in the world does God mean by that statement? It's, it's very simple. He is saying that it is useless to count on your natural wisdom or natural goodness here in this world. If all this is true, then to count on a heart which is desperately corrupt and sick and deceitful above all is a foolish thing to do. And if you build your life, or gain your wealth, wealth and value and riches on that basis. In the midst of your life, they will abandon you. They will leave you desolate. They will let you down. Folks, you and I need to turn to Jesus. You and I in these sinful days need to repent of the evil that's in our hearts and lives, and we need to run to Jesus Christ. We need to stop pretending that everything's just going to fix itself on its own. We need to stop pretending that we can fix it ourselves. We cannot do it. This is what Jeremiah is saying. Look at what he says in verse 12. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our salvation. A glorious throne on high from the beginning is the place of our salvation. This is where man finds the answer to his life, the solution to his problems, the understanding of his own nature, and the supply of his need for a place to go. The good news is, is that you and I can let go of the old man. And the place you and I can go is to God himself. The life of God is available in Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel is in the Old Testament as well as in the New. These old prophets like Jeremiah understood this just as much as we do. And so here's Jeremiah's lesson. He stands and he prays and his prayers are beautiful. Get down to verse 15. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my God. You save us this morning. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me. And I will be saved for you, God. And I pray. No one else can do it. Only the one who sits in the 
glorious throne set on high from the beginning can heal me. The prophet stands before him and says, Lord, here I am with this heart which was given to me by birth, which is desperately corrupt and deceitful above all things, and all I can do is to bring it to you again and again. Lord, whenever it raises its head, whenever that old nature raises its head, I need to cry out, heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Not the ways of this world, not the ways of these times in which we live in, but you, God, are my praise. That's the one who remains strong. That's the one who remains green. That's the one who will never run dry. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Charles Spurgeon said, in Christ, you have a fountain of joy which frost cannot freeze, and peace cannot take away. In Christ, you have a fountain of joy which frost cannot freeze. Folks, I just simply want to ask you this morning, to whom are you turning in these challenging times? Who are you counting on in these days? If you're counting on the politicians to figure it all out, you will be sadly disappointed. If you're counting on the culture to figure it out, that somehow, some way, people will wake up and realize that that they, they, they can't do it themselves, you will be sorely disappointed. Folks, we need to turn to Jesus. We need to lean into him in these days. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I will be saved, for you are my praise. Is that the song of your heart this morning? Perhaps you're here this morning and you are, you are trying desperately in your own way and in your own strength to figure it all out and make things okay. And the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and said, you know what, I can't do that. I can't rely on myself. I need Jesus. And today you may want to come and profess your faith in Jesus Christ. The one who can save you, the one who can change your heart, the one who can, who can turn things around in your life. Perhaps you're a follower of Jesus and you're looking at this world and you're disappointed, you're distraught, and you just need to cry out to God again, perhaps in a, st- in a time of recommitment of yourself. Lord, I, I, I can't do this. I've, I've strayed. I've, I've moved away from where I used to be. And Lord, I, I need to come back. Heal me and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved. For you are you're here this morning, you're saying, Lord, I feel so dry. I feel like I'm in a desert. I feel like I'm, I'm thirsting to death. Come to the living water. Come to the place where spiritual nutrients will fill your soul. If you are here this morning and you do not have a church home, you do not have a place to call home, you do not have a place of, where people, yes, we're all fellow strugglers, we're all sinners, but yet we're saved. And you need a place where you can come and exercise your faith and live out your faith and have people who are living out their faith with you and that will help you along life's way. You do not have to do it by yourself and you need a place to belong. First Baptist Church, Pastor Ralph is ready to receive you. To whom are you turning? Let us turn to Jesus. Let's pray and we'll close. Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I pray broken by this text of Scripture. But while we are broken, we will have hope. We see the hope in this text, that we do not have to remain in the desert, but we can come to the living water. We do not have to, to, have to be starved of the spiritual nutrients that we need. We can come and sit by the water and stand by the water. Lord, in this sixth day, Time in which we live with this world is convulsing with evil. Lord, let us cry out to you, heal me, heal us, O Lord, and we will be healed.
favor. Church, would you stand with us, please? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me see always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages to me. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and Every power as you choose. Here am I, hold me. Take my life, it's all for thee. church, and you may be seated for just a moment. All right, so before we dismiss today, I just want to reiterate the importance of uh, Bible school that's coming up, and Miss Tricia has an announcement for that for us.
Also, we have one more. You know, but some of you may not know that today is Outreach Sunday. So Outreach Sunday, we have three things happening downstairs. First, we have a light lunch. So we would love for any of you who want to join us in Outreach this afternoon to come downstairs and uh, eat a light lunch with us. After that, Cassie is going to share with us on um, how to do outreach, how to go out and share. And then we're going to divide out up into groups and go out into the community and visit people who have visited our church in the last couple months. So, again, all of you are invited right after service downstairs. Thank you. All right. And hopefully uh, by now you've had a moment to fill out your uh, budget team nomination slip. If you haven't, uh, please take time to do that. Uh, before we do our sing out and you can drop those in the offering boxes that are at each door so you won't have to worry about collecting those or nobody's going to come around to collect them it's going to be up to you drop it in the boxes on the way out okay so for those of you that have already filled that that uh, piece of paper out thank you for that for those that are doing it right now that's great all right so if you will let's stand together and uh, we're going to sing out uh, to uh, the this great song alive and breathing so if you will, uh, just join us in this this morning. Let everything, let everything, let everything praise our Lord. In the work. Breathing, praise the Lord. 